Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today, we'll be marking the 20th anniversary of the Gulf War II, known as Operation Iraqi Freedom, that marked the invasion of Iraq. Warm welcome to the programme and uh, we have a very special guest uh, for this programme to mark the 20th anniversary of the Gulf War and that is Major General Tim Cross, uh, CBE um, and uh, you know you have the inside view of, of what happened uh, during the war and then the aftermath of the war that uh, I can't believe was, was 20 years ago um, but Tim can you share with us how you came to uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as, as you've been a, a prominent uh, Christian in, in uh, uh, serving with distinction within the British Army. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, like it could be a long story, but the bottom line is I was raised in, in a nominally Christian home and my wife and I were married in church and children were baptised and so forth. But I did a tour the, with the United Nations in Cyprus in 1981. And as a result of that, we managed, Christine and I, to go to the Middle East, to Jerusalem, and we're just as a tourist, really, over Easter weekend. And while we were there, we went to the Garden Tomb. And the Garden Tomb that year... 1981, uh, on the Sunday, the Easter Sunday, my 30th birthday, uh, the, the guy that day was a, an ex-British Army colonel, a guy called Dobby, and uh, he showed us around the garden tomb and opened up the gospel, particularly the gospel of John, and explained that this could well be the place that Jesus was crucified. There was a, a first century wine press, there were various other bits and pieces was outside the old city wall, hill shaped like a skull and so forth, and a first century tomb. And he said, I think this is probably, this is probably the place. He said, but actually, in a way, that's almost irrelevant. He said, but if you go and look in the tomb, the tomb is empty. And I don't know, I, I think back to this, I often wonder what I thought I was going to find when I stood up and walked over to this tomb, sort of leant against the entrance. But I found myself thinking, if this tomb was empty on that first Easter Sunday morning, that has to be the most extraordinary event in, in history, really. And I'd never really given it very much thought, is the truth. Um, if it hadn't been empty, or the whole thing was a... Um, you know, was, was a facade, then for 2,000 years plus, hundreds of millions of people have been completely wasting their time, as Paul says in one of his letters, you know, if, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then we are to be pitted amongst all people. But if he had risen, then things had to change. And I went back to Cyprus, where I was working with the UN, and as a result of that visit and that experience, committed myself to be a disciple of Christ, as my wife did separately to me, actually, a different story. But so it was a, a defining moment for me. So that was the uh, best part of uh, 40 years ago. Uh, in fact, 40, 41 years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been, a, I've been a follower of Christ ever since. Amazing. Uh, and can you just share with us as well, particularly for our viewers, because this is really important as well, um, your faith in, in Jesus Christ. How did that have an impact on you as a, as a high-ranking officer in the British Army in which you reached the, uh, the rank of uh, Major General? Yeah, well, I was a captain at the time. Um, so I wasn't that high at the time uh, and I came back from Cyprus um, and uh, did a staff college course and, and I was an ATO in, in, in Northern Ireland and doing other things. Uh, but I then became a company commander, subsequently a battalion commander, then a brigade commander and then a divisional commander. So over the following 20 years or so, uh, I did end up by, by rising in rank. Um, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, long story of all sorts of issues. But in terms of my faith, I think changed the way I led. I became a different leader. Um, I think the way I took some of the decisions I would subsequently take, particularly in places like Kosovo and elsewhere and operations, were different as a result of having become a Christian. Um, and I think, to be frank, I think I treated people better than I had previously. I don't think I was ever an ogre, but, you know, the love of Christ and the, and the recognition that every human being is magical, unique human being, soldiers and, as well as anybody else, meant that I think, you, you know, we treated, I treated people differently. Um, and uh, I, never, I never felt that I needed in any sense to beat, <laughs> beat the soldiers overhead with the Bible. I never preached at them. But the way that I conducted myself and the way that I ran the organizations, uh, people would certainly and did 
you know, recognized pretty quickly that I was a Christian. And I had lots of really interesting conversations with people, particularly in operations where people were watching, as I subsequently did, you know, mass graves being dug up. Soldiers would ask some pretty sensible questions. You know, what on earth is going on here? Why do people do this to each other? So the idea of a fallen world and the idea of sin and the idea of uh, the fact that, um, you know, we, we, are, we live in the world that we live in was a great opportunity to, uh, to preach the gospel, but in a practical, you know, way of, of, being, of serving in these various places. Oh, which is incredible. So thank you so much for sharing your testimony as well. And um, Tim, you're involved in the uh, first Gulf War um, that really started when um, Saddam invaded Kuwait in, in 1990, in August of 1990. I was uh, 15 at the time. And, and this is when I really became interested in the Middle East. The world's focus was on Kuwait. It was focused on the Iraqi invasion and, and then this huge military build up um, in Saudi Arabia to liberate Kuwait, which happened in, in February of, uh, of 1991. Um, can you share with us uh, your involvement in, in the first Gulf War of uh, 1991, your involvement, what that involved, and, and the strategic aims and objectives um, in this war that were very, very different from the war that we're remembering now in, in 2003? Yeah. yeah, well, I think to put it into context, we. The Cold War, of course, had come to an end, effectively, in 1989. And we, amongst other nations, uh, the government decided to take a fairly substantial peace dividend. And to be frank, a lot of us stood around the various barracks and officers' messes and places saying, what are we going to do now? Because the Russian threat, the Warsaw Pact threat had got away. Uh, but we woke up, and it was a strategic surprise to most people that Iraq had moved into Kuwait. And so the initial reaction was to establish Desert Shield, a UN Security Council resolution was passed. The Americans led very much on pulling the coalition together. And we deployed a brigade into Saudi Arabia as part of Desert Shield. And that operation was to stop the Iraqis going further south and trying to take the oil fields in northern Saudi Arabia, having secured the, the Kuwaiti oil fields. Now, there's lots of issues about the politics and what the Iraqis thought about Kuwait and so on and so forth, which we, we don't need to go into. But that Desert Shield was successful. Whether Iraq had intended to go further south, we never really know. But then we moved to Desert Storm, which was then the operation to push Iraq out of Kuwait. Uh, and the UN again passed resolutions on that. We then deployed a full armored division under General Rupert Smith. I was part of the headquarters team in the logistic world. Uh, we deployed four armored brigade along with seven armored brigade, a big artillery brigade, a big engineer brigade, a big logistic brigade, communications, medical, and a lot of medical assets and so forth. So a very substantial division, best part of probably best part of 25, 30,000, along with a big air component and a maritime component. Uh, and we were part of seven US Corps, which um, in the end, we, we provided the flank uh, along with seven US Corps going round the outside of Kuwait, cutting off the Iranian uh, guard and um, you know getting them out along with the US Marines who came in from the south into Kuwait City itself and I ended up I remember ending up on the road from Kuwait City to Basra leaning on a Land Rover listening to the BBC World Service to decide or to, to hear whether or not we were going to go on to Baghdad in 1991 um, and I think the decision right at the time was no that was not going to happen there were pictures of this road littered with vehicles and casualties. It was, it was called the road of death at the time, and the Iraqis were you know, heading, heading for home. But the coalition that had been pulled together included Jordanian, Qatari, and other Arab nations, and I don't think they would have ever held within the coalition if we had said we were going to go on to Baghdad at that time. So we all came home relatively quickly. It was a very successful operation in, in that sense. But of course, in the intervening 12 years, we ended up with Saddam Hussein using, gassing the Kurds, we had to establish a northern and southern fly zone. The, the Marsh Arabs uh, were given a hard time by, by Saddam. The marshes were drained. Um, and over that period, a number of UN resolutions were passed, which essentially were ignored by Saddam. In that period of the 90s, of course, we shouldn't forget that there were the Rwandan massacres. The Balkans broke apart as Yugoslavia, Tito died, and the Balkans broke apart. So we were seeing ethnic cleansing, we were seeing brutal dictatorships doing terrible things. And we should remember that the Rwandan 800,000 people died not using modern weapons. I mean, they were, it was machetes and you know, people being killed with, in, in very, in inverted commas, simple ways. So people like Tony Blair at the time, I um, mean, his famous speech in Chicago saying, we cannot go on allowing this sort of thing to happen. We have, we have a responsibility to protect people. And responsibility to protect became a UN policy, effectively. 
So then we run into the turn of the century and of course September the 11th um, and the response to that from the Americans in particular who we need to understand and I, we can maybe pick this up a bit later but you know America was at war now and they were determined to do something about uh, September the 11th. So they put together the operation into Afghanistan and that was very successful in the early days and they then began to plan operations in Iraq and maybe subsequent operations too. And our Prime Minister and others had to decide you know, whether they were going to go with them or not. So I was part of a divisional headquarters as a Lieutenant Colonel back in 1990-91. By now I was a Major General um, and you know, events unfurled as we shall discuss. And I think you, you make, make a really, really important point that is kind of missing from the kind of uh, post-war analysis of the war in Iraq in, in 2003. Um, not actually talking about how America was attacked on 9-11. I mean, the Twin Towers were destroyed from, from Al-Qaeda and Islamic terrorism. Um, the Pentagon w was also hit. And uh, if it wasn't for those brave passengers on that uh, flight, yeah. The likelihood that the White House uh, would have been hit or even the um, Capitol Hill building. So America was very much under attack. Uh, George W. Bush was, was found himself as a wartime president uh, and the American people essentially wanted justice. Um, so what do you think the motivation was behind George W. Bush uh, Jr.'s decision to launch Operation uh, Iraqi Freedom? Was it one of a combination of realising that America has to deal with threats in the Middle East and those Middle Eastern states like Afghanistan and Iran that harbour Islamic terrorist organisations that could pose another direct attack on the United States and was also personal because we know that the Iraqis tried to assassinate uh, his father George W. Bush when he visited uh, Kuwait I think in, um, in 2000. Yeah well it was it certainly was a combination of issues I mean it, it was a combination of what I talked about in the 1990s and, it, and it genuinely and I think we know we need to understand this people are very critical of Bush and Blair and others but what was going on in the 90s was you know, tens of thousands of people, in Rwanda's case, hundreds of thousands of people being massacred. Um, and the attack on, on uh, the uh, Twin Towers and so forth had a deep emotional and psychological effect on the Americans. They hadn't had their territory attacked since Pearl Harbor. So this was not just a small clique of neoconservatives. This was a widespread view in America that we needed to do something about that. And that was never reflected hit back here in the UK. America moved to a war footing. And the Central Command Headquarters in Florida, which I subsequently visited, were planning uh, what to, how to respond to that pretty quickly after the event. Um, so uh, the, the reaction was a mixture of events that had gone on beforehand and now what do we do, as opposed to hanging around waiting for other things to happen. As Macmillan said, events, dear boy, tend to drive these things. They, they wanted to get ahead of the game, if you like, and preempt and do something about the regimes pretty brutal regimes in the Middle East. And it wasn't just restricted to Iraq, it was thinking about what else you know, would follow. And I think it's also important to also to, uh, to realise as well, when we're reflecting back on the Iraq war 20 years later, um, that Saddam Hussein was a totalitarian dictator, had total control of his state. Um, his uh, secret police would happily murder and torture anyone that, that opposed him. You mentioned that he gassed his own people, the Kurds in the north, I think in 1988. Then after the war in Iraq, it first Gulf War in 1991, he um, attacked the, the Marsh Arabs, suppressed the uh, Shiite majority in, in Iraq, um, and was a, a figure of fear essentially for ordinary Iraqis. Uh, can you tell us the, the context in which the build-up of the war started because uh, according to the American planners that I know that working in, the, uh, the, in Dick Cheney's office in the White House, they were prepared to go in with American forces as early as October, November of 2002, but it was Tony Blair who wanted to get a UN mandate uh, for this war. Um, can you share with us the kind of build-up to sure. the war that eventually uh, occurred in March of 2003? Sure, and we shouldn't forget that in that intervening period, Iran had a major war with Iraq, or Iraq had a major war with Iran. Um, and a lot, you know, a huge number of people were killed. A, a war fought in almost First World War tactics in many cases. I think it was 1.5 million died yeah. in that war. And the West, of course, had tended to support Iraq in that period. 
And, um, you know, obviously now we look back on that and wonder how that was, was the case. But in geopolitical terms, that was probably the right thing to do at the time. Now, so, so September the 11th happens. Americans decide they're going to do something about this. Set the Central Command Headquarters in Florida begin to do the planning. They execute the Afghanistan operation. They then begin to think about what we're going to do about Iraq. The, UN had, the Americans had used the UN. There had been conversations in the UN, clearly, but no firm Security Council resolution had been passed that would have justified, in, lead, in, in, in international legal terms, an invasion. Um, but nonetheless, when I first went to Central Command in September, October 2002, uh, it was pretty obvious that they had a free hand. They, were, they would have been preparing to move in prior to Christmas, certainly, in, in 2002. Um, the Americans wanted a coalition to do this. They didn't want to do this on their own. In the same way as they pulled the coalition together back in 1991, they wanted to have a coalition to do this. So they were talking, obviously, diplomacy with lots of other countries. And Tony Blair had a good relationship with Bush. UK obviously has a good relationship with America. We've been together on many operations. I've served alongside the Americans many times. So the overall sense was, if we do have to go to war, if, if, if Saddam doesn't give in, in inverted commas, then we do have to go to war. We should be doing this alongside the Americans in a broad coalition. And therefore, we need a UN Security Council resolution. And Bush definitely I, took his foot off the pedal, in inverted commas, and said, OK, try and get that through, um, which Tony Blair did. Now, in the original military planning uh, for the potential operations in Iraq, we were going to put an armored division in through northern Iraq, actually through Turkey, alongside a US division, US 4th Division, with a view to coming into the Iraq from the north, and the Americans were to come, a lot of troops were going to come up, up from the south, from Kuwait into Iraq. And over that period of those negotiations in, in the UN and elsewhere, we the UK, we the UK as in Tony Blair and the UN, our UN representative and so forth, came to the conclusion the Turks were never going to allow us in. So we made the decision to move everything we were going to do to the south. Now, at that stage, I'd been stood up to be the, what was called the Joint Force Logistic Component Commander for operations in Iraq. And I had two logistic brigades and a lot of assets based in Cyprus, which was going to be our forward mounting base. Uh, and to be honest, it was going to be a very difficult logistic operation. We were going to have to land in the, uh, on the ports in the eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean, move about 400 kilometers to a place called Silopi, a single railway line, a single major road, with another US division alongside, it was going to be really difficult. So that decision to go south, actually, uh, I was quite pleased with. And I was stood down as that component commander, and I handed that on to one of my brigade commanders. But that period of time had taken me to Central Command, where I worked alongside the other component commanders and our joint force commander, uh, a guy called Brian Burridge, an, Ameri an, an, an RAF three-star uh, commander. And you know, it's seen the, seen the workings of Central Command, and it was pretty impressive. But what was clear at that stage is that nobody was really thinking about what was going to happen after the military campaign. And I'd been involved in some post-war stuff in places like Kosovo, when after we'd moved in, my brigade, I was a brigade commander at the time, had rebuilt railways and, and prisons and, and infrastructure in all sorts of different ways. So having been stood down as that Joint Force Logistic Component Commander uh, and come back uh, to my, my job, my day job, if you like, around December time, uh, the then Chief of the General Staff, General Mike Jackson, rang me and said, I want you to go to Washington and join a team in Washington which is being run by a retired US three-star general, a guy called Jay Garner, and find out what is happening about post-war planning. <laughs> so the Americans would have gone early. They gave uh, Tony Blair some space and time to try and get the UN to, to pull together some sort of resolution. That didn't happen. Other uh, European military or governments, Germany, France and others, didn't want to be part of this without a UN resolution. And other nations were on the edge, really. So the US and UK were really the only two major players at this stage um, planning this operation. And at that stage, we're now talking about January 2003, the idea was that we needed to get fully uh, mobilized in terms of getting our troops out to the Middle East to prepare for a spring offensive in simple terms. Were we ready, though? Was the I mean, there's been um, uh, with a lot of the post-war criticism of the war in Iraq, um, particularly people I work with in Parliament, uh, with the likes of Colonel Patrick Mercer, 
who did a great job standing up the armed forces in Parliament, saying that uh, in the aftermath of the war in Iraq, um, our troops weren't uh, equipped properly with the right equipment, uh, everything else. What are your thoughts? Were we, as a military force, really prepared, maybe not for the actual overthrow of Saddam Hussein and his regime, but what would happen in the aftermath of, of his overthrow? Well, there are two or three aspects to that. Firstly, we had, of course, fought the war 10 years previously or 12 years previously. But a whole, the whole sort of sense of the U U British Army was that we were defending in Europe against Warsaw Pact. We were going to fall back on defensive positions and so on and so forth. We we'd fought this campaign in, in the Middle East 12 years previously, which was an offensive operation in the desert, very difficult circumstances. And I remember digging out pamphlets from literally from World War II and the Alam, the North Desert, the desert uh, campaign in, in North Africa to look at the logistics and all that sort of stuff. In the intervening years, there had been defense cuts, there had been uh, you know, changes. The, the systems that we'd used in 1990 were, were relatively new. Challenger, AS-90, Warrior, you know, extremely good bits of kit, many of which are still in service today, I might add. But you know, 12 years later, this kit was older. Um, but I think, we were, I think militarily we were ready for a, a high-intensity warfighting operation. The, the real question was, uh, what was our part going to be in that, in terms of working alongside the Americans, and what was going to happen post-war? Um, now, we, we, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that the US military planning was good. General Franks you know, at Central Command and um, the Land Component Commander of the American Forces and so forth put together a very good campaign plan. And there were lots of things that could have gone wrong. Um, the idea of, of Saddam using nerve agents or chemical weapons, which he'd used previously against the coalition in the desert during the, during the military campaign. Some sort of Stalingrad type approach of making uh, Baghdad a fortress, which would have been a really difficult fight. Uh, none of that came to fruition. The Americans conducted, along with our guys, a very good military campaign, which secured Baghdad you know, relatively quickly without all of the things that may have happened. The question was, at that point, were we ready to, to go to the next phase? Those, those military operations are called phase one to three, and phase four is the post-war planning. When I'd been in Washington, in the, in the, I went in January and was there through February and March, working with Jay Garner, it was pretty clear that nobody had given serious thought to post-war planning. To be fair, the State Department in Washington had done a fair bit of work on this. But the people who were driving this was DOD, Defense, uh, US Def Department of Defense, which was headed up by Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld was driving this whole thing and didn't want any other people in Washington, any other departments, really to have any serious part to play. Cheney, I think, was the key figure. I don't think President Bush actually was involved you know, day to day very much. Clearly he was the president, so he had to give oversight of this. But Cheney, I think, was driving this. Um, Rumsfeld pulled all of Jay Garner's people together. And, and when I went out there, I worked in the Pentagon with Jay Garner, along with my MA. We, we lived in a flat in Arlington. Uh, and I mean, we started work at five o'clock in the morning and finished at 10 o'clock at night. Went back to the British Embassy, where we produced reports, which were sent back to London to the uh, chiefs of staff and the foreign office and so on. But over that period, it was pretty clear that we were not going to be ready to conduct post-war operations. Unless you believed, which is the problem really, Rumsfeld and others believed, that once we'd had the military campaign and got rid of Saddam Hussein, then the Iraqi people would essentially stand up, give us a thunderous round of applause, and we could move on to the next issue. Um, and that was plan A. I had a lunch with, with Rumsfeld. Um, and about eight or nine senior American military uh, in the February sort of period, towards the end of February, beginning of March. And they were discussing, you know, the campaign and so on. Um, and quite rightly, focusing initially on the military campaign and, and reassuring Rumsfeld that, um, you know, they could conduct this and, and win it. There were tensions. The Afghan campaign that I referred to earlier had been a relatively light campaign in terms of heavy armor and so forth. There really been special forces. And that had been very successful. And Rumsfeld wanted this campaign to be conducted in a similar way. So he did not want hundreds of thousands of troops and heavy armor and so forth involved in this. And he wanted to get people out pretty quickly afterwards because he thought that he would be able to do that. So he wanted 
around 150,000 American, and we were putting up about 50,000 Brits. America, some senior American generals were saying, you're going to need 300, 350,000. Um, and he actually sacked one of his four-star generals for saying it. People who were speaking against the paradigm that Rumsfeld and others had, had you know, locked themselves into. And his plan was within six months, they would reduce their 150,000 to around 50,000, and we would reduce our 50,000 to around 20,000, something like that. So that was the plan. And, I, and at, at this lunch, he, he asked me what I thought and so forth, and, you know, my involvement. And I said to him, in Northern Ireland in the 1970s, we had the best part of 30,000 British troops around the Operation Motorman period in the early 70s, 27,000, something like that. I mean, Northern Ireland is a tiny place trying to secure the environment. In Kosovo, we'd had about 60,000 coalition troops uh, under General Mike Jackson, the K4 commander. You know, a tiny place. Um, if this goes well, we may be able to secure Iraq with the sort of numbers you're talking about. But Iraq is the size of France. And if, if things don't go well, the 50,000 and 20,000 is not going to be able to, uh, to hold and secure Iraq. Secondly, you have to, we, I think in my view, Mr. Secretary, we're going to have to work with the UN and the non-governmental aid organizations and so on. Because the UN itself was saying, for example, that there will be a humanitarian catastrophe when this, when this operation uh, is, uh, is uh, you know, started. Um, possible use of chemical weapons, uh, lots of people injured, and uh, food and water crises and all sorts of stuff. And, and I went with Jay Garner to the UN uh, to, for a session with them, um, with uh, Louise Frechette, who was then the Deputy S Secretary General. And she made it quite clear that the UN's view was this thing was potentially going to be ca catastrophic and that we, the coalition, would own the problem. And therefore, we would have to have, have the assets necessary to, to deal with the humanitarian problem and the rebuilding problem in terms of infrastructure and so on. Now, we, the Americans were not planning on any of that. So the size and shape of the force, who we were prepared and not prepared to work with, and thirdly, I, th I said, I think we just need more of an international coalition. Without being unfair to Rumsfeld, because leadership is not easy in any circumstance, but he didn't want to hear this. So, you know, I was cut out of the paradigm again, um, and they pursued that plan. My final comment to him was, okay, plan A is what you think is gonna happen. What's plan B and what's plan C? because of the three plans in any military organization you put together, it's always the fourth that happens. That's just the nature of the business. Events drive this stuff. Uh, and um, I mean, before the start of the program, you, you, you talked about um, having discussions with the then Prime Minister, then Tony Blair. Um, why do you think Tony Blair decided to go in with uh, George W. Bush and uh, align ourselves with the American forces to bring about the removal of Saddam Hussein and effectively bring about regime change uh, within Iraq? Yeah, well, again, I would go back to Tony Blair's... He'd been Prime Minister, of course, during the 90s. He'd, he'd been Prime Minister for the Kosovo operation, and he'd driven that quite hard. And Clinton, who was president at the time, was very reluctant to put ground forces into, into Kosovo. And I give Tony Blair great credit for, for his leadership over that period. And that had been a successful operation. And he'd given that speech in Chicago that I referred to earlier. So he was quite clear that the principle of getting rid of a brutal regime that was killing many of its own people was under this umbrella of responsibility to protect uh, in the modern world, in inverted commas. You know, he was emotionally, if you like, was signed up to that. Secondly, there was the strategic alliance with, with America which was, you know, is very, has always been and is very important to the UK. There's always been this tension between the UK Atlantic Bridge and the UK relationship with Europe. I mean, it's, it's you know, part of the Brexit issue and all the rest of it. But that relationship was very important. And to not go along with the Americans, as we had done in the first Gulf campaign, and as we'd done with them, obviously, during the Cold War and in subsequent operations around the world, would, would have been a very big strategic decision to make. And then alongside that, and I, I briefed uh, Tony Blair and, and the, sec the Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw, and others about my concerns over the post-war situation. And from a purely, purely personal point of view, my argument was we shouldn't, do this, we shouldn't conduct this invasion till the autumn, because that would give us you know, several months to work this through better. Uh, and there are all sorts of things behind that we can talk about. But you know, we had got troops deployed already. 
the Americans, as we've said already, were ready to go, very keen to go, and would have gone before Christmas 2002 if, if there hadn't been you know, us alongside them. And at one point in about March time, I think, Rumsfeld, recognising that the, we hadn't got the second resolution and recognising Tony Blair's political situation, Rumsfeld literally stood up publicly and said, you know, I understand where the UK are, and alone and unafraid, we are going to do this. So it was pretty clear that whether we were alongside them or not, they were going to go into Iraq in March, around March time. And then alongside that, and in briefing Tony Blair and indeed others, and it, it, to be honest, it's part of my own thinking, was at the end of the day, this is the world's superpower. And whatever is needed to make this happen and work post-war, it will happen. You know, there was absolutely an underlying view that they're not going to allow this thing to collapse. Um, notwithstanding the fact that there was pretty scant evidence of the preparations for that. Um, and I just think, uh, you know, under the, un in all of that conversation, Tony Blair in his office, in his bath at night, would have said to himself, we've got to be alongside the Americans. This is probably the right thing to do. I don't think, I think a lot of the flack that's been thrown at him was, you know, unfortunate, if not unfair, and others will disagree with me about that. But also, you know, this is, this is the world superpower, and together, uh, you know, we can make this happen. Uh, and Tim, can you just share with us um, the first moments of the war that occurred on the uh, 19th of March 2003, known as uh, Shock and Awe, uh, this huge bombardment of, of Baghdad, um, which, which then became uh, almost like theatre. You're actually watching a movie at the time and just seeing this huge explosions going off in Baghdad. Can you share with us, uh, as we're seeing now on the B-roll mm. there, mm. Uh, the tactics used by, by the American forces before ground troops went in on the 20th of March 2003? Well, yes, I mean, it's part of uh, what was used in 1991 as well, of course. And, the, and, and when you're conducting a military operation like this, the first thing you need to secure is air supremacy. Uh, I mean, you could argue air superiority, which is a slightly different thing. But, you know, you want air supremacy. You want to be able to operate in the skies and be able to uh, make sure that the, there's no enemy, enemy aircraft around. I mean, we see this played out to a degree in Ukraine. You want to ensure that the logistics, the lines of communication, and the ability of your enemy to fight is as disrupted as, as possible. So what they were doing in Baghdad, but also elsewhere, was taking on you know, uh, logistic bases, uh, lines of communication, bridges, and so forth, to try and disrupt the ability of the Iraqis to respond. Now, a large chunk of this operation was going to be conducted in the desert, so there's, you know, in that sense, there's not much you can do by that. But they were also directing their attacks against known Iraqi positions and so on. So you're trying to, be, you're, before you send your land forces into battle, usually what you're trying to do is prepare the ground and prepare the environment to make sure that you know, they have as much potential for success as possible. There is another approach which is to do a preemptive land attack without any of this, so it, it's a surprise if you like, but there was no way that we were going to achieve strategic surprise. I mean, it you know, be going on for months and these forces are being deployed and so forth. So what we saw in that is not dissimilar to what we saw in the shock and awe campaign back in 2001. And both of them were pretty successful. Um, and the reality is when I went into Baghdad in, the, um, in, in uh, March time, um, the day actually we went in basically was the day the, big, the statue came down. I mean, the place was, the infrastructure was in a terrible state. It was basically held together with chicken wire and chewing gum. Uh, you know, elect, it, it, the generation of power, the distribution of power, uh, the water distribution, um, the hospital situation and, and all of the infrastructure was in a, was in a terrible mess. Uh, and some of that was pre this invasion because there'd been sanctions going on in Iraq in the previous 12 years. But the Iraqi engineers and people had done a remarkable job in holding the thing together, really. Um, but what happened then, of course, was a lot of that was disrupted. And can you show also the success of the operation? Because it was a, a very swift, a very um, quick uh, <coughs> military operation to see the removal of Saddam Hussein, particularly the, uh, uh, the Iraqi Republican Guard as well, that um, that's where the, the toughest resistance came from. Yeah, and that, that applied back in 91 too, and, and the, you know, taking out the Republican Guard was a key part of achieving military success, land, land, land component success. Um, it, and again, it's easy to forget that this could have been a long drawn out campaign. Now again, I don't want to link them too closely, but what we're seeing Russia conduct in the Ukraine, you know, a year on, they're still battling their way. This could have gone the same way. Um, 
when you, when you look at this military campaign, or indeed any military campaign, what we're delivering in the military we call fighting power. And that consists of the physical component, the stuff, the armoured vehicles, the aeroplanes, the helicopters, the logistics to support it and so forth. Uh, and we had shed loads of stuff, but so did the Iraqis. They had a lot of people and a lot of kit. The next component is called the conceptual component, which is, okay, you've got all this stuff. Do you know how to use it well? Are you up to speed in the latest thinking and doctrine? And we were conducting maneuver warfare, which we'd done in 1999, um, you know, back in, sorry, 1990, 1991, in the first Gulf War. But we were using modern military thinking, and we outthought as well as outfought the Iraqis. And the third component, which is hugely more important than the other two, the other two are crucial, you've got to have them, but we call the moral component of fighting power. It's the willingness to die for the cause. Um, and the, the coalition moral component, as the Ukrainian moral component today, is very powerful. The, Iraq, the Iraqi moral component was very, very poor. The vast majority of their soldiers did not want to fight and they gave up pretty quickly. Now, that doesn't mean to say all of them did, and there were some nasty fights on the way into Baghdad uh, and with some of the uh, Republican Guard people. But overall, that physical component, conceptual component, and moral component was overwhelming. And, uh, you know, we won that campaign very quickly. Uh, and the reason the Russians are not doing as well is because in all three of those areas, actually, they haven't really got the advantage they needed to have. So when did it all start to, to go wrong? Um, yeah, yeah. We, we remember that uh, famous scene that George W. Bush was on that US air uh, carrier saying, you know, uh, mission over, mission complete. Um, and then it just seems to, it just went <coughs> disastrously wrong after that. And particularly as, the, as we saw then an insurgency campaign um, being fought against British troops in Basra and the south of Iraq, um, Baghdad became a, a, a essentially almost a, a, a terrorism state. Um, were the military planners kind of aware that this would be the result of the removal of Saddam Hussein and actually initially winning him and, and, and actually getting rid of uh, Saddam Hussein and the Ba'athists? Well, it's a, it's a long story, but essentially, I mean, there's, there's certain things here that I think are worth worth saying. One is, and I, I hesitate to, to be too clever or condemning about this, but within the American, and I have to say within the British Foreign Office, there was an extraordinary illiteracy about religious issues in the Middle East. I mean, senior people not understanding the distinction between Sunni, Shia, Kurd, Turkmen, Christian, or whatever. So that idea of just getting rid of Saddam and thinking that everybody else thinks much the same as we do, you know, we do have this tendency in the West to think about the rest of the world should think as we think and want what we want and all that sort of stuff. So there was a lot of misunderstanding about what we were going into when we got into Iraq. Alongside that, the military had seen what had happened in 1991 and the American military had been involved with this, many of their soldiers, for, for a good year at this point. They'd been training, they'd deployed, they were ba you know, based in Kuwait and elsewhere. And the, when the military campaign finished, they, were, they wanted to go home. And from the land component commander, Dave McKeon and downwards, people were ready and preparing to go home. They wanted to go back to the ticker tape parades and write their books, and get their medals and all the rest of it. Um, so in, again, in, from a moral component point of view, if you like, it was linked to that. We've done our bit and they had done it well and they were ready to go home. And because Rumsfeld's plan was, it's gonna be fine, they were, you know, they were prepared for the fact that they were going to reduce from 150,000 to about 50,000. Some new people would come in and everybody else would go. Um, now, when we got into Baghdad, the, there were three issues that Jay Garner, and I've got a lot of time for Jay, by the way. He was a very capable operator. Um, there were all sorts of issues that we could talk about. But Jay's initial plan was there are three strands that we need to deal with. One is the humanitarian problem that the UN and others, a lot of the aid agencies and the NGOs had been uh, talking about for weeks, if not months beforehand. The reality was there was no major humanitarian problem in the sense that people had been putting on the table. But he had a string of people who were gonna focus on the humanitarian issue. There was then the infrastructure issue, the immediate rebuilding of infrastructure, the bridges, the roads, opening up the lines of communication and so on. And then the third strand was rebuilding the ministries and the ability of Iraq to begin to run itself again. 
So if you imagine going into London and around Whitehall, you've got your Foreign Office, you've got DFID, you've got the Treasury, you've got the Ministry of Defence, you know, Trade, Department of Trade, and so on and so forth. And Jay had a team, teams of people, very small teams, and we could come back to that, but teams of people whose job was to go out and find these ministries and it re-establish them, find out what they needed, talk to the people, and get them up and running again. And then the, f and so that was those three strands. Alongside that was to conversations about how is Iraq gonna run itself once this is over? An interim Iraq authority that Jay was working towards. Uh, and that's a complicated story that we can come back to. Now, there was no humanitarian crisis. There was a civil, there was an infrastructure problem, but these ministries were key to getting this thing up and running. Jay and I went up to the Kurdish region, which I have to say was like going to the liberation of Paris. I mean, they were delighted to see Saddam gone. Uh, we then went to Basra, who were pretty pleased to have seen him gone. But the infrastructure in Basra was in a terrible state. I mean, there was raw sewage running through hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it was a really awful place to see. And then the Marsh Arabs we've, we've touched on, and then Baghdad itself, which was l not completely, but certainly largely pro, um, pro Saddam. And of course, we had, Saddam was still around at this stage. We hadn't, they hadn't, you know, we hadn't found him collectively. So everything was, you know, trying to get this thing up and running quick, fairly quickly with Jay. The military were not being particularly helpful because they were focusing on going home. These, we found these ministries and began to, to, to do some work there. But then, the, initially, there were then some rioting, and you may remember the pictures of museums being looted yes. and government buildings being looted. And that was worrying, and the American military just didn't, weren't taking that seriously. I mean, I'm seeing this from a Baghdad perspective, because I'm in Baghdad with Jay. And Rumsfeld famously said, oh, this is the exuberance of having got rid of a dictatorship and all of that stuff. By now, we're running into June, about May, June time, 2003. And things are not going well in terms of the, what Plan A, you know, had said it was going to happen. And the decision was made to pull Jay Garner out of the lead and bring in this chap, Paul, Paul Bremer, Jerry Bremer. Um, now, I'd, I'd had a conversation with Jay, and we haven't got time to go into all of this, but, you know, Jay, you're effectively going to be the Viceroy of Iraq, I mean, in, in our you know, terms of, and, and therefore the world's media is going to be on you, you're going to have to control this, you're going to have to bring the military under command, and you're going to have to drive this. Because Jay was a retired three-star military, and there were four-star serving military, uh, John Abizade and others in, in Iraq, he never felt that he had the authority to take ownership. Um, and there are all sorts of stories I could tell you. Bremer then arrives, and Bremer does take on the mantle, effectively, of being Viceroy. And he does three crucial things very quickly. We're now talking about mm, June time. Firstly, he disbands the Iraqi military. Jay had not wanted to do that. He'd wanted to use the military to help clear up the place, apart from anything else. Nice and he wanted to pay them and help use them to help with security. And when we look back in Japan in 45, in Germany in 45, and other places, you know, that's not been unusual to do. But Bremer, and I, know, I, never, I don't know to this day whether he came with this decision in his pocket, I think he did, and I think it was a, probably a Cheney decision or a Rumsfeld decision. Basically, he said to the Iraqi military, go home. Not just go home, but we're not gonna pay you, and you're not gonna get your pensions. So every, every soldier suddenly thought, well, how am I gonna survive? And the, you know, I'd been a brigade and a divisional commander. What happened was those equivalents of the Iraqi military rang up their staffs, rang up their people and said, pick up your Kalashnikovs. We're going to have to, you know, fight for a living here somehow. The second decision was to de yeah. the hierarchy of Iraqi society. Now, I'd, I'd said earlier on that it was all held together with chicken wire and chewing gum and so forth. But at, at this early stage, under Jay's team, we had got people talking to the electricity generators, the distribution, the hospitals, and so on, and we're beginning to build relationships with these people. All the numbers in one and two in these departments had either been killed or had fled. I mean, they were hard Ba'athist people. But in Iraq, like many other places, and you know, in dictatorship terms, if you weren't a Ba'athist, you didn't get a decent job, really. So the numbers three, four, and five in these organizations were Ba'athists, but they weren't hardened thugs and criminals and so forth. They were engineers and scientists and nurses and doctors and so on. But Bremer came in and took this head 
down to, and the only debate was how deep does he go, but he basically took the head. And therefore all the capable, all of the people who'd been driving and working in the industries and in, the, in these various um, you know, civil society areas and got rid of them all. Again, just sent them home. And I, I watched as you know, senior military generals were in tears over the fact that these relationships that they built were just being disintegrated in front of them. So debarthetizing the whole society took the head off the, the government and the ability and the capability to run these departments. And then thirdly, he slowed down the whole political process of this interim Iraq authority that I touched on and essentially said, I am going to run this place for the next 12 months. And anybody who thinks they're going to get involved in you know, some sort of Iraqi government and so forth, you know, it's not going to happen. So all of those military, all of those senior Ba'athists, all of the politicians end up by being cut out completely by Bremer. We've got about nine minutes left of the programme, Tim. I could certainly do another hour with you because it's absolutely fascinating. But can you share with us where we saw the uh, Iraqi insurgents with the birth of al-Qaeda in Iraq? We saw the awful suicide bombings. Uh, we saw, again, these horrible terror tactics that we saw during the uh, civil war in Lebanon. Uh, Westerners being uh, held captive. Um, and then uh, pleading for their lives in front of the television set, in front of a, a TV camera, pleading for their lives, and, and then having these brutal videos of where we're seeing their heads cut off. Um, explain how Iraq ended up from being liberated to this failure to transition to an Iraqi government, and then a full-blown insurgency. Yeah. Well, and, and of course the birth of ISIS and all, all that flo followed from that. Again, if you, you, know, if you don't understand military, uh, sorry, the, the Middle East and, and, the, and the nature of Middle East politics and tribal politics and the, the distinctions in the Muslim world and, and so on and so forth, um, which I don't think you know, a lot of people did understand it deeply. Um, a very senior Iraqi said to me in Baghdad, the Americans don't understand why we hate them and that is why we hate them, <laughs> which is a very profound statement when you think about it. He then said, you Brits understand why we hate you, but we don't hate you as much as we hate them, because we obviously operated in, in the Middle East for a long period of time. But the, initially, this terrorism is about not just looting, but it is about trying to create, you know, have a living. People were just trying to create a living. But the distinction, having, having had a regime that was a minority regime that had used brutal power against the majority, inevitably, there were people who just wanted to take revenge. I mean, we'd seen this in Kosovo, when everybody, when the Albanian Muslims had gone back into Kosovo, beginning to have a have a crack at the Serbs, who'd you know given them a hard time. So there's initially there's all sorts of issues going on, but amongst it is revenge. It's amongst about saying we're now going to have power here, we're going to run this place with the majority. There's then the distinction between the Kurds and the and the and the and the, and the uh, Arabs and the and the Muslims and so forth. You then got the interference from Iran. Absolutely. And Iran's influence was, you know, obviously uh, pretty heavy fairly quickly. I remember early on people asking, you know, was Iran going to move in? And I, my answer was no, not with, not with the Americans and ourselves here militarily, but they'll move in to try and work with um, the, uh, the, the South in particular and create an insurgency. And the, Ira the Iranians wanted to create an insurgency against the West. And alongside that, notwithstanding, or, or inclu you know, in including my earlier comment about the Americans, is we shouldn't underestimate a lot of Arabs do not like the Western world. I mean, you know, there's a deep-seated issue going on here. Uh, we tend to think that everybody, you know, freedom and light and democracy and so forth is... You know, at the end of the Cold War, there were these books that were written about the end of history and Fukuyama and various other people. You know, that's not the way that all the world thinks. We see that with China and Russia and Iran and Korea and other places. So I think we were quite naive. And because we didn't have the ability to stamp on this early, which if you'd got the troop density that we'd had in Northern Ireland or Kosovo, in other words, if there had been 350,000 US troops and 50,000 British troops able to secure that environment quickly and then enable the civil uh, changes to be made, maybe we could have held the line, but we never did. And the American military were very slow in responding to this you know, collapse. So you end up with this internecine warfare going on, and you then end up with, a, with the influence of Iran, and then from there, of course, you know, these other things flow.
over, I mean, I, was there, I came back in 2003, so we're talking about stuff going on into 2006, 7, 8, and beyond. So with five minutes left of the programme, Tim, what would you say is the legacy of the war in Iraq known as Operation Iraqi Freedom 20 years on? And, and because of the war, are Western governments now a bit more fearful uh, about um, entering into conflicts? Uh, we know that British tr the British Armed Forces are helping to supply the Ukrainian forces to push back the, uh, the Russian invasion, and we know we're very much committed to, to that war. But again, um, carrying out operations against uh, threats and dictatorships. Um, do you think because of the war in Iraq that there is a reluctance now to get in an, involved in any wars like we did in Iraq 20 years ago? Yeah, I think there is. Um, these were what you euphemistically called wars of choice. These were not wars that we had to fight for national survival, as in World War II. So these were wars of choice. They were wars that, that, as we discussed earlier, were genuinely felt to be necessary by people like Tony Blair and others to deal with the world as it was and the terrible things that were going on. Um, but they hadn't gone well. There's no point in pretending otherwise. And although Afghanistan went well initially, you know, at the end of the day, we pulled out of Afghanistan in not a particularly you know, impressive way. Um, and Afghanistan is, is now where it is. So you don't need to be you know, anti-America or anti-British to say these wars didn't go well for us. Now, why not? Because we didn't have the force levels in place. We weren't prepared to stay there for as long as we probably needed to be. I mean, we were in Northern Ireland for 30 years before the, before the Good Friday Peace Agreement, effectively. And the Balkans wars are still going on, one way or another. Um, you have to be engaged in these places for a long period of time. And we in the West weren't prepared to do it. You've got to be fair to the Americans. They've thrown trillions of dollars into these campaigns in both Iraq and Afghanistan. But I think for most people, they would say, this hasn't gone well, and therefore, why should we get involved in anything else? And it's reflected in our response to the Ukraine, where we are effectively allowing Ukraine to fight a proxy war, which we are providing equipment for and financial support, but not prepared to put boots on the ground, to coin a phrase. Now, I happen to believe that's right, because the Ukraine are not part of NATO. But if this were not to go well, then maybe there would be a war of necessity, as opposed to a war of choice, if Russia were to move into the Baltic states or try and take on Poland or where else. So the legacy, I think, is a reluctance in the West to engage in this, a recognition that responsibility to protect sounds great morally and ethically, but there are consequences if you want to follow that line. Um, and, you know, apart, apart from anything else, we've seen the reality of quite large cuts in defence spending in the UK and, in, uh, you know, and initially elsewhere, although that's changing as a result of Ukraine. And there's a big debate going on now about what happens in the UK. And, I, you know, I think, too, perhaps people are realising that whilst we would want to see a world, a free world, and, I, you know, be under no illusion here. What do I want to see? I want to see a world of freedom where people can make their own choices about which God they serve, about who they vote for, about what their government looks like, you know, what we might call liberal democracy and capitalism and so forth. We, I think we now realise that quite, quite a lot of people around the world, they're not happy to live under brutality, but they, they, they just seem to be prepared to, to do it, and they're very reluctant to rise up against it. So I don't know where it leaves us, you know, as we look ahead to the next 10 or 15 years, but I, I think the, the, what's happened in that period of 2000 to 2015, 2017, you know, is undoubtedly has, is not going to go away quickly. You know, we're, we're going we're gonna to live with the reality of that for the next couple of decades. Uh, and, and, and Tim, the final minutes of the programme, um, do you want to share something about uh, the courage and the bravery shown by British uh, forces uh, fighting in the Iraq war? And, and um, you know, being a soldier, you, you don't have a choice. These are political decisions that are made in, in Downing Street and, and they have to make those choices. So w within 30 seconds. Yeah. Well, you know, we talk about courage and, and that's true. And there are two types of courage, of course, physical courage and moral courage. And the physical courage that you have to display it is displayed in these campaigns by soldiers on the ground, particularly by those, you know, at the front end of the battle, the infantry and the armoured corps and so forth. Though the nature of the battlefield doesn't change much. At the end of the day, it's about a willingness to fight and engage and be prepared to die. And that takes courage. And uh, the British military have been good at that quite a long time. And I think we're still very, very good at it.
So Major General Tim Cross, thank you so much for an insider's view on uh, the Iraq War uh, of 2003 as we mark its 20th anniversary. So thank you so much for being my special guest on the programme. And I just want to thank you for watching this programme today. It's always special to have an inside view, particularly as we mark the 20th anniversary of the war in Iraq, known as Operation Iraqi Freedom, and how not only did this war change the Middle East, but it also changed the world in which we live in. So thank you for watching this week's edition of the Middle East Report.